thank you. Um, I would like to thank Ted for the platform. I was somebody who was born in England and I was taught to be silent. I was taught that to speak outside your family or outside your community, you dishonoured your family. So it is a privilege to be here to break the silence of so many people. So I share this platform with all those victims and survivors out there across the world. I would like to start by sharing with you a little bit about who I am, the human being that stands before you today. My father came to England in 1952. Like many migrants, he was invited to England in search of work. He came from rural Punjab. He was a Sikh man. My mother joined him later on in her life, and we were born. I'm one of seven sisters, and I have one brother. The only home I know is England. England is my home. It's the only place I know. We went to British schools in England, and I watched many of my sisters 35 years ago being taken out of British schools to marry men they had only ever met in photographs. They would disappear one by one, and nobody questioned their absences. Nobody asked where they were, and they were flown to India to marry this man in this photograph. In fact, my sister Rabina was two years older than me. She returned as somebody's wife and was put back into my year at school. She had a wedding ring on her finger. Her appearance completely changed because she was no longer allowed to wear Western dress. And yet nobody asked where she had been. I was 14 years old when I came home from school one day, a normal school kid in England, and my mother sat me down and she presented me with a photograph of the man I was to learn, I was promised to, from the age of eight. And I was the one who said no. I remember looking at this picture and thinking as a 14-year-old girl, he's shorter than me. And then thinking about homework and things. My mother was very matter-of-fact, very jovial. She did this with all my sisters. And by the way, none of my sisters protested. Not one said no. So here was my mother faced with this child of hers who was protesting. And she said to me, I was difficult from birth. I was the only one born in a hospital, the only one born upside down. And so she was expecting this somehow. <laughs> so I was allowed to go back to school. But the pressure really mounted when I was 15 and a half. Because growing up in England did not actually give me the same life as my peers. We were brought up to believe that we had the power to honour or dishonour our families through our behaviour. So there were certain things that we were not allowed to do as normal adolescents growing up. For example, we were not allowed to go to the school disco. We were not allowed to cut our hair. We were not allowed to wear makeup. We were not allowed to even talk to a boy, let alone date a boy. We had to dress very modestly because all these things were deemed right and proper and honourable. So if we breached any of those codes, and I call them codes because it was conditioning. We were learnt to do this through our behaviour and we were ruled by fear. These were the rules of engagement and if we breached them, we put ourselves at risk. It could be a trigger for significant harm, physical abuse, a forced marriage, and even though we know today, even murder. So we were very careful. Hence, you hear a lot of these girls living two lives, doing things in secret, away from their family and their community's eyes. When I was 15 and a half, that was when the preparations were happening for my wedding. And I really protested. So my family took me out of education, and they held me a prisoner in my own home. And when I'm in prisoner, I mean I'm locked in a room, and the padlock is on the outside of the door. Somebody's watching the door. I have to knock to go to the bathroom. Food is brought to the door for me to eat. And I was made to stay there until I agreed to the marriage. In the end, I agreed to the marriage purely to buy back my freedom. This was a time for me to plan my escape. And I was expected to take part in the preparation of this marriage. You know, the wedding dress, people come to see the bride. I can only describe it to you as somebody who had a bird's eye view and was looking down, and it happened to be my wedding. I ran away from home when I was 16 years old, in my final year of school, the most important year of school, doing my exams. 
I ran away over 150 miles from where I lived. I thought it would be safe there. My parents reported me missing to the police, and the police did find me. And here was an officer, 33 years ago, a police officer presented with this young person, begging him not to send her home, pleading him. And thankfully, that police officer gave me the right response. One, he believed me. Two, he did not send me home to mediate with my family and treat me like this strapped little teenager who could actually work this out. Because I can tell you this today as I stand here before you. Had he sent me home, I would be in that marriage. My parents would have presented a different face. Once the door closed, it would have been a very different world. But the officer did tell me to ring home to tell my parents I was safe and well, which is exactly what I did. I'd like to share with you my family's response. And I'd also like to tell you it was my mother and the females in my family who were the key perpetrators not the men. I'm ashamed to say that women do uphold these honour systems and are the gatekeepers to this abuse. My mother was very clear. She said, you either come home and marry who we say, or from this day forward you are dead in our eyes. That I had shamed them, I had dishonoured them, I had done this to them. So here I was at a crossroads in my life, and I had a choice to make, and it was a choice. I could have gone back home to everything I've ever known or be on the outside as somebody who was now disowned. I chose the latter. And there are many victims out there who have to make that choice. But what I didn't expect was disownment. It's like me asking you to imagine waking up tomorrow morning and never seeing a member of your family ever again or never seeing your familiar surroundings and everything you love and being made to feel it was your fault, because that's how they made me feel. I internalized that as guilt and as shame. I attempted to take my life twice in my teenage years. I felt horrible. Did I love my parents less? Had I done this to them? And I started to live my life, albeit without my family. I had a secret relationship with my sister, Rubina. We would talk in secret. Sometimes disowned human beings have secret relationships with their siblings. And my sister Rubina suffered a horrific marriage. And she would tell me how she was being beaten up on a regular basis, psychologically and physically abused. And I would say to her, leave your husband and come and live with me. I will protect you and look after you. And she would say, that's easy for you to say because you don't have to think about what people think. You don't have to think about honour, which translates as izzat. Because she was right. I was disowned. So I begged her to speak to my parents, and she did. She spoke to them, our community leaders were called, and they all did the same thing. They all mediated and talked her into going back to the perpetrator. My sister was 24 years old when she set herself on fire and she committed suicide. For whose honour? And my family's response was this. It was better for her to take her life and not dishonour the family than for her to leave her husband. As a result of her death, I came out of hiding and I established a charity called Karma Nirvana. That was established in my front room 20 years ago. And that charity is now a national charity and it goes on to support victims like Shafilia Ahmed. This young girl was born in Britain. This young girl's crime in life was to have ambition. Her ambition was to be a lawyer. She wanted to be a normal adolescent. All those things you take for granted every single day are the kind of things we can be significantly harmed for. This young girl ran away from home many times. She went to five organisations, police, health, teachers, you name them, they were there. And she was telling them, this is happening to me. My family are abusing me because they think I'm too westernised. And if you don't protect me, they will take me abroad and they will force me into a marriage. Shafili was very clear, and she ran away from home several times, and she was constantly talked into going back home. Because it's cultural, isn't it? It's what we do. You know, it's part of my culture. I can tell you this. Cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. It is not part of my tradition, culture, or religion to abuse anybody. And professionals need to wake up and own that as a fact. I know there are many professionals out there, as I go on my travels, who try to rationalise this. But what they did in her case, not in my case, thankfully, and I'm here to tell the tale, is that they try to sit down and mediate with perpetrators. 
Because the sad thing is, the people doing this to you are the people who are meant to love you the most. Your parents and your siblings, and your wider community. So in the end, Shafilia went back home after many times of running away and telling people. And she's now on a plane to Pakistan. Her parents drugged her and put her on a plane to Pakistan. She's 16 and a half. And she's on that plane, she goes to Pakistan, and she's presented with a marriage proposal because they wanted to deal with her being too westernized through a forced marriage. And she swallowed half a bottle of bleach in protest. She came back to Britain. She was in one of our hospitals in the UK on a ward for eight weeks where nobody visited her. And where, was she, where did they return her? The protective agencies, back to her family. Within a few weeks, I can tell you, her mother and father murdered her. She was 17 years old. They held her down and they put a paper, uh, carrier bag down her throat until it disappeared, suffocated her, and her siblings were told to watch. They were convicted last year of 25 years. This is what we call honour killings. We know there is no honour in an honour killing. However, the motivation for the crime is honour-related. These are the kind of girls that ring our helpline every single day. I established the Honor Network helpline in 2008. To date, that helpline has received over 30,000 calls just in the UK alone. This is happening to people born in Britain. Please don't think that because I was born in the UK, I have the privilege of independence, of a free mind. That could have been me. And nobody could have told me this at 16. I have three beautiful children. It's the first time I'm sharing their picture here with you all. And nobody could have told me at 16 years old, I was making that decision for the future. As a 16-year-old, what do you know, really? You know, I just didn't want to marry a stranger. But the legacy is important, and we need victims to own. And I'm testimony to that, as are many thousands. You can live your life or be disowned. We know, and I miss my family terribly. I do. You know, I was the only one that graduated at university. I hadn't read a book until I was 27 years old. It's the first time I ever read a book in my life. And I achieved my degree, and I got a first, by the way. And I remember wanting my father to be in the audience, but my father wasn't there. He refused to come. When he died, he left me an executor of his will. So he spoke a thousand words in his death. I remember for the first time going to my house where I was brought up, opening the door, going into his bedroom, and in the corner of his wall was my graduation picture on the wall. But he couldn't say that when he was alive. And I know that deep within him, he knew what was right. But the power of an honor system is so great that it only exists because people allow it to, not just within our families, but within our communities. When girls like Shafilia are murdered, I don't hear our communities crying out and saying this is wrong. I don't. I put myself at risk, yes, but I fundamentally believe there are thousands out there just like me, like Shafilia, and we need to break that silence because nobody should have to go through with a forced marriage. And we do it, and we do it for the future. My daughter, Natasha, on the far right, when she was growing up, I used to say to her, Natasha, whatever you do, do not marry an Asian boy. And she would say, Mom, you can't say that, that's racist. And I used to say, Natasha, no, you don't marry a boy, you marry a family. The reason I say to this to you is because I was her mother. I'd run away from home. I'm twice divorced. I married out of caste. I'm a campaigner. What family is going to accept that? They might take it out on my daughter. And that was my biggest fear. Because one of the things I had to do when I left home and they disowned me, I had to divorce myself from all the wonderful things about my tradition because of the pain. And I miss that. You know, Diwali was this week. It's a Sikh significant festival. You know, I know Sikhism and Islam does not support forced marriage or honor killings. In fact, it supports me. But we miss that culture and that tradition. But I had to do that because of the pain. You can only 
Embrace that if you have people to embrace it with. They are your family. So my daughter goes off to university, and she meets an Indian boy, as they do. The children, your children will do the opposite of what you ask them to. And for the first time in my life, here I met a family that did the right thing, that were born in Britain, raised their children here, and taught them to be free and independent. I did say to the mother, though, you need to read my book before I meet you, because she needed to understand my experience. And last year, thank you, next slide, my daughter was married. She had the big, fat Indian wedding, okay? <laughs> and not one of my family were there. But you know what? She had that day because of the decision her mother made when she was 16 years old. She had the right to choose who she wanted to marry. It also challenged me because I can finally put to rest the past. The only time my life was on hold was when I beat myself up every single day for what my family had done to me. When Rubina died, I turned it around, and I owned the fact that I was not the bad guy, I was not the perpetrator. They had done this to me. My honor was their shame. So I let them go, I forgave them, and I started to live my life instead of putting it on hold. And my campaign is for you to go out there today and break our silences, please, because we exist and we are wanting to believe that even without our families, there is a world out there for us. And you out there believe that this is happening and it's happening to people who live in a democracy. They do not have the right to an education and independence. The privilege doesn't come being in Britain. Those privileges were not my rights. My rights were taken away from me because I had a family who believed their rights trumped the rights of the country being Britain. Thank you very much for listening to me.